Now, let's go back to a place we've already looked at before, Revelation chapter 18, because it literally tells us that anywhere that, we can put it both ways, anywhere or any place that you find a lot of evil spirits, uh, devils, um, familiar spirits, unclean spirits, lying spirits, hateful, mean, ugly, ghostly spirits, any place you find those, you're going to find Babylon, mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, vice versa, any place that you find um, mystery, Babylon the great, any place you find mystery, religions, secret religions, religions, with secret doctrines, religions where um, they have the, the doctrine that they tell all the newcomers, but they can't tell them all the newcomers and the, the early birds, as it were, and the young converts, as it were. They can't tell them the deeper doctrines because that'll run them off. I remember several years ago, uh, a friend of mine who um, I've actually mentioned him who was saved in uh, or led to the Lord in a united Pentecostal church. Now they are a cult, plain and simple. They uh, do not believe in the the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. They, they believe that 1 John 5, 7 should be taken completely out of the Bible. <clears throat> Shouldn't have been there. They said, oh, the Catholic Church put that in there. Anyway, um, <clears throat> and they believe in work salvation. They believe that you have to manifest, well, you have to manufacture and manifest tongues or you're not saved and you can't be part of them. Okay, but anyway, he handed me a cassette tape of a teaching that a guy was doing. He was training their converts. He was training their people on how to go out, knock doors, and try to get into their homes to get, quote unquote, a Bible study set up. And um, they did it under the guise of, there would be somebody there with a, with a clipboard and a piece of paper, and they would be checking off boxes, and, and they would the other person would say, hi, uh, we're from uh, uh, whatever, life, Pentecostal church, and uh, we'd like to have a, uh, a talk with you, and we'd like to visit with you uh, about the Bible. If, where, where, do you have a church place to go to? No, and somebody writes that down. We're just taking a survey right now. So all we're doing is we're taking a survey to see, you know, who in this area goes to what church. And the guy actually said on the tape, um, he said, don't get too far into that survey thing. He said, remember, you're not really there to do a survey. You're there to get a Bible study going. In other words, you go under false pretenses. You go there and, they, and you can't tell them, you can't show up at their door and say, listen, I don't care where you go to church, it's wrong, 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 wrong. There is no Godhead. You must speak in tongues and, and flop around. You have to do that in order to be saved. Now, can we expect you at church Sunday? Nobody's coming. So they have to hide their doctrine. And, I, and I'm just saying, any place where you find the evidence of Babylon, like in a secret society, like in a Masonic meeting, or Odd Fellows, or the Catholic Church, or any of those other places, then you're going to find these devils. And these devils, let's look at it, Revelation 18, 12. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was enlightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every, and you notice I have some devils here, of every unclean and hateful bird. And I just, I just can't get this out of my mind. You know, I've never played the game and I've never seen the movie, 
but maybe I sh maybe I should just you know see what it's like. I I haven't played video games. Oh my goodness. Uh, since I started the Watchmen broadcast, I haven't, yeah, that's how far back I go. About 2009. I just did, I just don't have time anymore, and I don't have the desire anymore. Okay, I want to I want to know what the Bible says. But anyway, angry birds, hateful birds. But notice I have an owl. And that owl looks like a gray alien. Now, uh, this is not the video for this. I actually have one out where I show the, um, the relationship that exists between the manifestation of owls and alien visitation. In fact, Aleister Crowley, uh, you remember him, this evil occultist. He performed a ritual, and uh, he called it the Alamantra working. In other words, it was a pretty serious, pretty sophisticated um, uh, ritual where he manifested this, um, this satanic, evil, demonic, hellish, entity called lamb and he was able to sketch a picture of lamb and lamb now this goes back to the early 1900s remember our current sort of visualization of what aliens possibly look like goes back to the early 1990s when whitley streber came out with communion and he had an artist paint for him uh, this alien that he kept seeing uh, over and over on board uh, this unidentified flying object. Uh, and he said it was a female alien, a female entity, and uh, that he had had fornication with it on several occasions. Okay? That would make her, the strange woman, mentioned in the book of Proverbs, because remember the word strange also means alien. Look it up in your Bible. Look up every occurrence of the word alien. Look up all the occurrences of the word strange. You're going to find them together, where the Bible is identifying one as the other. If they are strangers here, that means they're not from here. And when we apply it to going from the terrestrial to the celestial, if they are if they are not of the terrestrial but of the celestial when they come down here they're not they're not one of us anymore they are strangers and they are aliens but anyway notice the similarity uh between lamb this big head and we go back to this uh picture of these owls uh that i i can tell you just people all over the world having or about to have a ufo experience of some kind there's there's in many occasions going to be an owl there and i believe that that is showing us a spirit that is involved in the whole ufo mess the whole ufo uh phenomenon is is uh, people don't misunderstand me i do not believe that Martians are going to come and invade the earth with these ray guns. It's going to be a lot more spiritual than that and a lot more subtle than that. And it's not going to be a time of terror for people. It's going to be a time of welcome to our planet. We want you here. Okay. So <clears throat> now Jesus is describing uh, what happens when there is an abundance of, of evil spirits or unclean spirits or familiar spirits that show up to a person. He says it in Luke chapter 11. We've covered this before, but I'm kind of building into where we're going now. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits 
more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. And I think many, many levels of interpretation and many, many different understandings can be gained by studying this and meditating on it and thinking on it and and asking God what it would mean. But definitely, definitely one of uh, the applications that can be made similar to when I uh, talk about the use of Ouija boards and how I, I knew some, uh, some kids in my neighborhood, kids, we were teenagers, but kids, um, and uh, they were all having a party and uh, in the basement of their house and one, somebody goes to get a Ouija board and they're going to play, quote unquote, with the Ouija board and they start messing around with this thing and all of a sudden that planchette is moving and what's happening is a spirit moves that planchette on its own. It does, it answers whatever question you, and you understand that's, that's a, not really demonic possession, but it, but it is a form of uh, a spirit, an evil spirit saying, uh, scoot over, let me answer this for you. And it gives this answer, but at, at some point, um, somebody started levitating up off the basement floor of their house. And everybody's like, ah, and they freaked out and never touched that thing again. So that, that could be an experience where uh, you have one unclean spirit there. They have an experience with it, but they decided that's not what they want to do. And so they just, through their own, uh, through their own will, they say, no, I, I'm not doing that ever again. But what if, what if someone in that group, let's say a young lady of that group or whatever, decided that that was an interesting uh, feeling they got. And they, they felt a rush of energy, a, a, a rush of uh, ecstasy when that person started, uh, maybe they were the person that started elevating or levitating. And uh, so maybe afterward they were playing with the Ouija board and moving the planchette and all of a sudden seven more devils come back and move in to that house that represents that person the la the latter end is going to be worse than the beginning and that's just, like I say, that's just one application, one level of it. But I, I do believe that a lot of people who get somewhat of an initiation into the world of the occult, magic, witchcraft, soothsaying, divination, uh, astrology, uh, necromancy, you name it. Once they get, once they get uh, a rush of that feeling and what it's like, and, and something just to think about that I'm going to throw in here. Every form of sin, <clears throat> every form of sin, whether it's lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, always gives us a rush of an ecstatic feeling. It, it's, like, it's like when the first time you get high. Or the first time, um, you know, morphine, first time some, a doctor, a hospital <clears throat> gives you morphine or something like that after a surgery. And you're like, whoa. The first time, and there are people right now, listen, we have a problem in this country. It is bad. And, and I don't see how we're going to survive it. The, the amount of um, uh, fentanyl that is that is being sold in our country street fentanyl the amount of the amount of that is 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 killing people i know a guy that i i thought i had led him to the lord he was he was a guy that i just dearly loved 
and I wanted him so much to, to prosper in the Lord, but he messed up his marriage, had a child outside of his, of his marriage, and uh, later got back into the drugs that he was using, but he got, went farther than the drugs that he was using. And he watched his brother die of a overdose of Oxycontin. And what it was, his, his brother got out of jail one day, and the day that he got out of jail, he gets a ride to his sister's house, and his, he asks his sister, what are you doing? And she said, I'm, have you ever snorted Oxy? See, Oxy is supposed to be time release, so it just goes out in little bitty pieces. And he said, no. And so she crushed him up some, and I don't know what else she did, but he snorted Oxy for the very first time, put him in a coma, and he lived about a week before they pulled the plug on him. <clears throat> and he's <clears throat> this friend of mine swore that he would not let his life turn out that way, but he got a hold of fentanyl. And it's like that. You get that rush, and you think this is the greatest thing in the world, and it's not. It's a trap, people. It really is, okay? So when people, when people, I believe when people get uh, a spirit into them, it gives them the same feeling, the same uh, rush, the same high, okay? The same feeling of either getting a drug or getting, getting drunk uh, or, or uh, the release of emotion and experience that goes along with fornication, all of that together, that's, that's what I believe people are going to be chasing after when these devils come to take over. It's going to be easy because they're going to somehow, some way, touch the entire population of the world with whatever it is they've got and people are going to want to, they'll die for this, to keep this in them. So anyway, these, these devils, and the reason why I'm teaching on this these are for keeps, okay? This is real stuff, and it's extremely dangerous to uh, our generation. Gener there's generation above me that have such an addiction to pills and to marijuana and everything else, and you wouldn't think of it. I, I would never, could never picture my grandmother, my both grandmothers, godly women, Asking me to go out and get them some, some marijuana down at the marijuana store because it's legal now. They wouldn't touch that. They would not touch that. But that's, that's how we live now. This is the world we live in now. Grandmas and our generation and our kids' generation. And there you've got kids that are eight or nine years old that are getting high on marijuana. What a world we have created in this country. New world is right. Now, take a look here. This is uh, Dr. Stephen Greer. He is the, uh, the ER physician that is leading the charge to prepare mankind for the day in which the spirits, and that's what I'm going to call them now, the spirits that uh, exist in the, in the devil's realm are going to come posing as people from this other planet and they're going to bring enlightenment to the world. They're going to bring uh, a new world order to this world. They're going to, they're going to bring uh, new technology so that we're not killing our planet. We're not killing it now so that we're not killing the planet and, and, uh, they're going to bring in, uh, new ways of healing people so that the pharmaceutical companies, uh, aren't making trillions of dollars every year. In other words, everything that we know is going wrong with this world. Greer and others are telling everybody they're the John the Baptist of these spirit slash devil splash, splash, slash aliens that are coming with all of this great technology and they're going to solve all of all of mankind's problems and they're going to get them to to accept that all right so here on the bottom are three different spirit entities that somebody at one of Stephen Greer's 
events that he has of uh, what's what he call it the uh, uh, the fifth kind a, a close encounter of the fifth kind CE5 CE5 is a human initiated contact in other words uh, close encounters of the fourth kind was an alien quote unquote or a spirit that literally stole somebody there it's mentioned in the bible called men stealers that steal people and do whatever they want to and put them back without man's consent but here close encounter of the fifth kind or ce5 is the humans saying to these unclean familiar spirits come to us come down to us Give us your, give us your love. Give us your knowledge. We'll have your babies. We'll do anything you want. We'll become your slaves. Just come down to us. See, people, not, not everybody's going to be running and screaming and hiding from the beast and his armies. It looks like to me, they're going to embrace this. They're going to want it. So Leviticus 20, verse 6, And the soul, the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards. And I have found that familiar spirits and wizards several times in the Bible are listed together. There's something there. I, I don't know quite what it is yet. But there's a connection there. Turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go a whoring after them. I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among my people. In other words, God says, I'm not going to have it. I'm not going to have people. I'm not going to have people who are in my, amongst my uh, camp of the Israelites go after someone who is uh who knows how to contact familiar spirits or knows how to do wizardry I, i'm not going to tolerate that and the soul who does that notice he mentions the soul the soul is really who we are on the inside i mean our flesh yeah when i was when i was young when i was in high school i was fascinated by uh the lord of the rings the hobbit things like that. I, I read all the books um, and I'm like, oh, this is so cool. And at that young age, I, I wanted to be a, a, like a wizard. But, and, and I wanted that ring that, you know, made, made you invisible. Okay. Can you imagine a 17 year old boy with the ability to, to uh, become invisible? You get what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah, I was normal, just like everybody else is. Uh, but anyway, the older I get, the more I see the trap that it is. And God is saying, you got people like Stephen Greer and hundreds of thousands of others that are leading people into accepting these spirit entities, these angry birds, these hateful birds, these unclean and hateful birds, these evil spirits, they're going to go accepting them. In, in fact, let me point something out to you. Let me go back to uh, Revelation 18. Notice in verse 2, he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, number one, the hold, the hold of every foul spirit, that's number two, the cage of every unclean, that's number three, and hateful for bird. Four things, four gospels. That's not there by accident. It is literally a representation of the false gospel. When people turn themselves over to devils, foul spirits, unclean birds, and hateful birds now what is we're going to get into familiar spirits what is the definition of the word familiar 
If you think of the word, uh, it has a word that we use in it often. Family. So what would be the definition of familiar? It means that uh, I can recognize my wife. I can recognize my children, my grandchildren. Uh, I could recognize people in my church. I can recognize people, um, in, you know, from my uh, <clears throat> from my sister's family, my mother. I recognize my aunts, uncles, cousins. I recognize them. Uh, the people at the gas station. I go in, mo in the morning to get my soda pop. I recognize them because I'm familiar with them. So a familiar spirit is always going to have characteristics. And those characteristics can change. One spirit could probably one day look like your Uncle Freddy that died one time. And that same spirit may look like Aunt Doris, his wife. Okay? And I believe that it's, there's so many of these spirits. Remember, there is an innumerable company of angels. So if we take a third of an innumerable company, that means that there's a lot of them. Okay? They're never going to run out of devils. And so one spirit, two spirits, three spirits, doesn't matter. Those spirits have the ability to stay with one person their entire life and know everything there is to know about them because that spirit becomes familiar with that person's life. There's one that has been around me all of my life, maybe two, maybe three of them, maybe a whole dozen of them, I don't know. And they're familiar with me. They're familiar with everything that I am, everything that I look like, how I used to look like 40, 50 years ago, what I look like now, how I used to sound, uh, mannerisms that I've developed over the years, and so on. They're familiar with my father, my mother, my aunts, my uncles. So if, so if I woke up one night and I saw my dad standing there in, in my room, I know that would be a, a spirit. My dad's dead. He died in 2011. It would not be my dad. And I'm going to prove that to you in a little bit. We're going to study familiar spirits. And the Bible gives us that clue. In Job chapter 19, my kinsfolk have failed and my familiar friends have forgotten me. Psalm 41 verse 9. Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted which did eat my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. So you have two verses that are defining for you what the word familiar means. My kinsfolk have failed and my familiar friends have forgotten me. So my kinsfolk, I know who they are. I know my friends, who they are. They're familiar to me and they've forgotten me. Mine own familiar friend, whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, he hath lifted up his heel against me. By the way, that's a, a prophecy concerning Judas Iscariot. Okay? Jesus knew who Judas was, and he was familiar with him, and he turned his back on Christ, and it, it bothered him. Okay? It bothered him, even though he chose him for that reason. Jesus is still human, and, and he still... He still has feelings the way you and I have feelings. We would, I've been hurt many a times by people who pretended to be my friend. And yet I found out they were my enemy. Why they would pretend all this time to be my friend, I have no idea. Maybe the devil just used them unwittingly to try to bring me down. I don't know. But anyway... The idea of familiar means that they're recognizable, they are knowable. Uh, we could, uh, if somebody who came looking similar to somebody we know and tried to pretend that they were somebody we know, they probably wouldn't be able to pull it off because attached to the way somebody looks also is the way they sound. And 
maybe they make gestures when they talk and the in the absence of those gestures you might say uh he's not he's not jim uh i don't know who you are but i know you're not jim and we can't be fooled that way but but what if what if a spirit had so much power and ability that it could duplicate right down to the molecular level of everything that you know about somebody. And what if they knew things that only you and that other person know? Okay, I'm, I'm sure we all have. I've got, I've got one now. I'm thinking of right now. Something that uh, somebody I know asked me a question years ago. I mean, years ago. And I've never said a word to anybody. Never said a word to anybody. But I guarantee you there was a devil there. And that devil knew what happened. They knew the question that was asked. They know. Okay? And so that's what we're talking about when we're dealing with familiar spirits. So when it comes to... Um, when it, when it comes to uh, mediums, uh, and those are people who will convince you that they have the ability to get in contact with uh, Uncle Fred or Aunt Betty uh, or your cousin Bob um, or just anybody that you know, and uh, that you know they can answer questions that only Jim or Mildred or anybody. They, they can answer questions that only that person can answer, and they can convince you. Mediums, psychics, number one, psychics, uh, especially the big TV ones, they're a joke. They're an absolute joke. I did uh, Pastor Mike online here several months ago, and um, I, I, I talked about mediums and, and uh, uh, TV psychics. And I showed in a particular case that happened in our area, uh, it was the kidnapping uh, of a young boy from a, a town just south of here where I used to pastor. I didn't know this family, but I knew families that knew this family. Everybody knows everybody down there. It's a really small, tight community. And uh, I, knew the, I knew the familiars of the case, and I also know when they found him. And... Um, they had two different psychics working on this case and the information that those psychics gave to the police was all totally wrong. They got it wrong. They got it wrong. And in, in almost everything they said, they got it wrong. And I wrote down the number of things that they said and there was like one or two things that they were kind of close with. Got to give them that. But the other 15 things that they were totally wrong about would be enough for me to say, ah, listen, I'm not buying this stuff. Don't believe, don't believe this stuff, people. It's a joke. There are real cases where a familiar spirit will appear to people, maybe speak to people, and let me let me give you an illustration. I've got a book. Brad Steiger is he's made a career out of writing books on paranormal things, supernatural things, uh, everything from familiar spirits, ghosts, haunted houses, vampires, werewolves, um, Bigfoot, um, you name it. He's written multiple books on it. And one book that he wrote called Real Ghosts, Restless Spirits, and Haunted Places. If you look at this picture here, this photograph was taken of this little boy. And I think the mother, the picture was taken uh, immediately after two-year-old Greg said, Nana's here. Now, this gas sort of ghostly image was not present in the room. But whoever took the picture after the little boy said, Nana's here, 
when the picture was developed, remember that was the day we had to go back to Fox Photo and, you know, all, all the little photo places that you, you know, turn your film in, you got to wait a week and you get your film and so on. And um, this little boy apparently saw an image that looked like his grandmother, Nana, who had just passed away. So when he said, Nana's here, someone grabbed a camera because they could tell he was looking up at something. So they took a picture of him and this is what appeared. Now, to us, that looks kind of weird. But to this boy, more than likely, it was given to him to be able to see the entire image of his grandmother, I believe. So we have, and what's the purpose here? What, 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 does it, uh, what does it cause? What does it bring about? Well, it brings about the idea that people begin to question their old beliefs and then they start thinking, you know, maybe there is a spirit realm. Maybe, maybe it's true that those who have died, they stay around and they're here to help us. And they're, maybe they're watching over us. And maybe, maybe we can communicate with them. It would make us feel better if we knew that we could be in contact with our loved ones after they die. Wow, that would be great, wouldn't it? If we, as this little boy is looking up there at that, what he believes is his grandmother, that boy may believe that concept for the rest of his life. He may reject all of Christianity for the rest of his life. Or he and his family may try to bring that into Christianity and try to convince people, I believe that life does go on after death. Here's proof of it. This is my grandmother. I could see her. I remember seeing her body, her face. I remember seeing that. And uh, you'll never convince me that when someone's body is turned to death, that everything about them ceases. I believe that they still exist. I believe they're still with us here. And who, and, and who knows? But, but, but maybe God lets them be here to show us the way he, he would have us go. Maybe they are the angels now that guide our paths. You see how it goes? How they could turn people into angels? Well, angels are good, aren't they? Well, it depends on whether or not they're wearing a big pentagram on their head. I don't know. But anyway, um, yeah, there are evil angels out there that are familiar spirits. This video I've featured before, but take a look at it. This little girl uh, obviously sees something, maybe a little child sp spirit, and she's showing what she has in the green container, and all of a sudden, the green container uh, something is trying to pull it away from her. It is obvious that there is a jerking of that green container trying to get it out of her hand. And she jerks back and says, no. And then she has the other container. And she shows it to whoever. She's looking at somebody. And that somebody cannot be seen uh, on this video or we would, we would see it as it tried to pull away the other container. And she's reacting to that too. No, you can't have this one either. And she takes her containers and she walks away. 
Now, I, I can sort of see how um, uh, children of, of a young, young age could, um, could be led to believe or could be allowed to see um, familiar spirits and them being uh, represented as maybe human uh, or taking the form of a human, maybe taking the form of this little boy's nana, or in this case, maybe taking the form of, get this, do children often have imaginary friends? Yes. There are many examples on the internet of how children who are playing with imaginary friends, it turns out that these are not just imaginary. They are real and they are evil. I've seen several examples of that. So in this case here, you've got something that this child is obviously seeing and is not scared because apparently the child looks like another child or something friendly to her, but not friendly enough to be able to share her uh, Fruit Loops or whatever it is she's got in them containers. And when she's had enough, she walks away. We can't see it. Mom and Dad can't see it. That girl can see it. Of that, I have no doubt. And the reaction, the pulling reaction uh, of her trying to pull against whatever is holding the other end of those containers, it is obvious that something has gotten a hold of those containers and is trying to pull it away from that child. This is, this is real. This is real. And like I said, there are people who have had, uh, I, I, I will say that, at least one of my children had an imaginary friend. I will not say any more about it. Uh, we did not detect anything of a supernatural thing or a, uh, definitely of an evil spirit or anything like that. But there was a, a child of ours that had an imaginary friend. And certainly along with it came a very vivid imagination. All right, is what I'll say. Um, but it happens. And because probably these spirits understand that these children are at a certain age to where, number one, they can't tell fiction from reality, which is why it, you cannot convince children there is no Santa Claus. You cannot convince them there's no uh, Easter Bunny. You cannot convince them of this when the world convinces them of it every day. You're, you're fighting a losing battle, okay? You can tell them all day long there is no Santa Claus and they can repeat it after you three times, but the truth of it is they still think that there is one, okay? And just like I did when I was a little boy, okay? You couldn't convince me that there wasn't, all right? So anyway, now Luke, Leviticus 19. This is getting into uh, God's law again. Leviticus 19, 31, Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. There he is again. Familiar spirits that seek after, and neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. The purpose of these spirits is to defile, number one, Man's religious belief. If you can convince an adult, a teenager, a child that a, a familiar spirit actually is your former best friend that hung himself or killed himself or was killed in a car accident or uh, a, um, a loved one, a wife, a, a dad, um, grandma, grandpa that died of uh, cancer, died of a heart attack, uh, died in a, in a horrible accident, uh, and people like that. Once people get that in their mind that they are having visitations, 
of these spirits, these familiar spirits that look, sound, may even feel like and smell like the people that they used to know here on this earth. Once they become convinced of that, you are just, you're really, it's difficult to get them out of that belief. Why? Because we are, by nature, we are designed to be attracted to certain people in, in, in a very, very deep way uh, in, in th that involves love. And I'm not talking about uh, erotic love. I'm talking about pure, genuine love. The love that, you know, a child would have for his mother. The love that a mother has for a child. And I'm sure, I am positive, there are women out there, many women out there, who will have experiences in their house that may have lost a child. And because of the nature of the experiences going on in the house, they will believe that that's that child. Always oh, here. And that, and the husband will say, you know what? Let's, let's, this place is getting run down. Let's move to a better house. No, we're not leaving. We are not leaving this house. Jimmy is in this house. We're not leaving Jimmy. And so, that that's it that's the end of the conversation they do not want to lose their contact with their familiar spirit and so that is one way that a familiar spirit can defile someone is that cause them to believe that whatever spirit it is it is a genuine um it's the genuine soul of a former loved one and you are not about to do anything to sever that relationship some people will believe it so much that they will believe that they can speak to it every day that they can hear from it every day and there is no way in the world you're going to talk them out of it certainly there's no way that you could go to them with uh, the word of God and say, let me, let me give you a better way. Because if we have to tell them that more than likely, if their son, their daughter, their grandpa, their dad, their husband, that if they were not born again, they're not floating around here on the earth somewhere. They're in hell. And bare, it, it bare minimum, if they are, let's say they were born again. And they lived an, an active Christian life and they died. Certainly, they're not down here anymore. To be absent from the body, Paul says, is to be present with the Lord. And the Bible says nothing about the spirits, the souls of people that have passed on that are still with us and they go with us and they lead us and guide us and they are our guardian angels. Now that may have been your, that may have been your idea that some spiritual force in your house or part of your life is someone that has passed on and you loved them dearly and you're just very, very assured that they're with you every single day. I'm sorry, but it's not so. It just isn't so. And we'll find out. I'll have scripture for you in a little bit. But anyway, and another way to be defiled by them is for, let's say, a church and let's say in this church they had a, they had a, a very, very, um, a great man of God back around the turn of the, uh, century from the 1800s to the 1900s. Powerful man of God it brought in hundreds of people that were to be born again, built the church, um, you know, church running in five, six hundred, maybe eight hundred people because of this godly man. And he just preached the word of God with power and authority and, and so on and so on. And, 
And then people begin to have experiences. They begin to have experiences with um, th things that have happened around the church or things that have happened in their life where, uh, you know what I believe, Pastor? I believe that was uh, Pastor Thompson. Pastor Thompson, yeah, the, the Pastor Thompson that built this church up. I just have no doubt in my mind that that was, that was his spirit leading and guiding us. And I mean, he built this church and I mean, he's like still part of this church. And you know what? People end up believing that stuff. That Pastor Thompson or some deacon or whatever that gave their life serving the Lord for a particular church is now still functioning as part of that church. Or, here we go. The other Bethel church in Redding, California. Not our Bethel church. The Bethel church in Redding, California encourages what they call grave sucking. To go to graveyards where people who were supposedly great saints of God are buried because the idea is that a part of their anointing when they died, died with them. And that anointing, it could still be used. So what you have is you got people going to their grave sites, laying over their grave sites, their headstones, praying over them, trying to draw up whatever anointing they had left in their life to be put into their body. People, let me tell you something. I've done a little bit of research into occult things, if you haven't noticed. One of the things that I found out about Jewish Kabbalah practitioners is that Jewish rabbis are told to go to the graves of former Jewish rabbis and Jewish sages and do whatever it takes to get a portion of whatever anointing or whatever spirit they had on them so that they could understand Kabbalah. And that's what they do. It's Jewish mysticism. It's witchcraft. It's necromancy. They're dead. And yet people are convinced that if they go and they do whatever it is they do to try to suck their anointing or suck their spirit out of their dead body onto themselves and they can go in power and strength and authority. Oh my goodness. So people, when it says to be defiled by them, God's not kidding. God's not kidding. For someone to, maybe in a smaller church, to say that, um, and some churches allow this. They will allow for people to stand up as part of the service and say, uh, I'm getting, I'm getting an anointing right now. Uh, Brother Jim Harris, who you remember died several years ago. Uh, he is, he is in touch with me and he is telling me and they give off some prophecy and all of a sudden it happens. It happens. Well, then people are going to be like, oh my goodness, let's hear more from what Brother Jim Harris said. I'm just making these names up, by the way. And so, all of a sudden now, they're following the spirit of Jim Harris rather than the spirit of the living God in the Word of God. They've been defiled by that spirit. Mm. Well, the devil runs, he runs some pretty good scams, doesn't he? And he's running some very, very, evil scams and in today's world because of social media they're almost impossible to fight off and to try to warn people from the word of god don't do that when you try to tell somebody that's not really your dad talking to you when you try to convince them of that there's such a connection there, they don't want to let go. Uh, here's from that same book that I showed you, um, Real Ghosts 
restless spirits and haunted places. Ken left the hospital where his mother was dying of cancer. After he came home and checked on his wife and children, he finally lay down and tried to sleep. He said, I couldn't have slept more than 30 minutes when I felt what I knew to be the touch of my mother's lips on my cheek. Now remember, his mother's dying at the hospital. She's in hospice. Ken said, it was a kiss of such sweetness and love that could only have come from my mother. I opened my eyes and sat up. I had left a small lamp on in the room, and there in the dim light I could distinguish a kind of mist that had assumed human shape. Although I could not make out any distinct features, I knew that it was my mom. I felt the strongest emanations of pure love flowing to me from that vaporous form that it floated out of sight through the ceiling. You can see how dangerous something like that is. See the emotional connection when he's just left the hospital, his mom's dying of cancer. He goes home for a little while, he lays down to rest, and all of a sudden he feels a kiss on his cheek. And he raises up. He said it was a kiss of such sweetness and love. Remember what I said earlier. The things that familiar spirits will do to you, will, they, will, they will reach an area of you that will release this rush of energy, a high, um, forgive me, I will, use the, I will use the term orgasmic feeling. And once that feeling has been produced, you want more. I've read countless, countless. Well, um, I'm trying to remember who it was. Goldie Hawn. Goldie Hawn, who, who claimed now, years later, that she had an experience with aliens and UFOs. That she went out to sleep in... Uh, a friend of hers car because they were doing a lot of dancing instruction and so on and she was resting in her in her friend's car and she said uh, a UFO came over and it woke her up and she felt such a feeling strong feeling it said it was almost like being touched by an angel and it was just this strong strong feeling um, one lady gave the example she was supposedly on an alien ship and she was in severe pain and the alien just simply touched her on the forehead like this with his finger and all of a sudden all of her pain was replaced by absolute euphoria and when whatever whatever spirit that was took his finger off, the pain returned, she began screaming, so he put it back on. And again, the, the euphoria returned. People, people would give everything they had for something like that. And this is where the danger comes into play. Okay? Um, could it be the dead? And I've asked that question, you know, and people have asked me that question. Could it be the dead? People who disagree with me about Samuel. We're going to look at that again. Could it, could it really have been Samuel that was brought up out of the earth to prophesy to Saul? Could it have been? Well, let's answer the question first. Could it have been the dead? Is it possible that these people really are experiencing um, the return of those whom they love back into their human form uh, to let them know everything's okay, let them know that everything's all right, they have nothing to worry about, everything's going to be okay, and oh, by the way, I, let me, I'll tell you where I hid all the money. 
Okay, could it be them? Let's look at what the Bible says. In Psalm 88, verse 4, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that hath no strength, free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more, and they are cut off from thy hand. Psalm 88, 10. No, notice, though, back in that verse, they are cut off from thy hand. That means that God has no more to do with them. Psalm 88, 10. What thou show wonders to the dead, shall the dead arise and praise thee? Selah. Think about it. Psalm 115, 17. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into what? Silence. The Bible says right there that where they go is to silence. Which means they don't say anything. They don't talk. Ecclesiastes 9.5 for the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Look at that again. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Can someone come back from the dead and speak? In Luke chapter 16, we have the story of the rich man and Lazarus. In verse 27, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went out unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. You know, you know how true this is? We actually have one that rose from the dead. His name was Jesus Christ. And do people believe him? Most people don't. They don't believe a word of Christianity. They want nothing to do with it. So I'd say Abraham was right on this. Hebrews 9:27. Here's what happens when you die. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. People, once they die, they are judged right then. The righteous into life eternal, the dead into hell and that's it now notice Saul is saying to his servant seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit now let's look at this from the from the viewpoint of number one I, I've examined it many times looking for an, an answer to was it really Samuel, and I am convinced 100% by all that I've read in the Bible that it not only was not Samuel, it could not be Samuel. And if it was Samuel, it would be a violation of the things that God has said in other places of the scriptures. So to me, it just, it just really could not be um, it could not be Samuel coming back from the dead to tell Saul about what was going to happen in the next day's war. Okay? 
And uh, at this time, Saul has banished all of those who had a familiar spirit. And yet now he's having to go to one. And why is he having to go to one? Because God has already passed judgment upon Saul, King Saul, and said to him and, and that, I am never, ever, ever going to speak to you ever again. I'm not going to speak to you by uh, vision, dreams. I'm not going to speak to you uh, by Urim and Thummim, whatever that was. And I'm not going to speak to you by prophet. Well, there you go. Samuel was a prophet. So if God said to Saul, specifically, he used the word prophet. Saul, I'm not going to speak to you ever again by a prophet. What does that mean? Does that mean that now that Samuel's dead, that he can speak to Saul? No. He was a prophet. Plain and simple. And God said, I'm not going to do it. So... 1 Samuel 28, 7. Then said Saul unto his servant, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. And he went, and two men went with him. And, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits, and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a, a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul sware to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. So, verse 11, Then said the woman, whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice, and the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw God's ascending out of the earth. Now, some of you, some of you might be saying, ah, got you there, pastor. She said she saw Samuel. Remember, she is a woman who speaks to who? Familiar spirits. Spirits that look, act, speak, like someone that somebody knows, but they're not someone that somebody knows. They can't be someone that somebody knows because the someone that somebody knows is already dead. And we've already learned from the scriptures that once they're dead, they're silent. Once they're dead, they've already been judged. There is no contact between anybody in this world and dead people who are in fire, the fires of hell. There is no contact between us and them. The Bible said it. I didn't say it. The Bible said it. Now, there is a reason why this story is in your Bible. There's a reason why I've taken so much time to set this up. Okay? Because here's what I want you to understand. Let, let's, let's apply the rules of typology here. Okay, God has a doctrine, a prophecy. And he always draws a picture of that prophecy and what it means. Okay, So, while well, here we have um, uh, Samuel, who is the prophet. The prophet. The prophet is Jesus. Samuel represents Jesus. But since this is not really Samuel, it's another Samuel. Get what I'm saying? So this is more along the lines 
of a story of another Jesus. Think about it. Another Jesus that came up from the earth. But where's Jesus? He's up there. He's going to come down from heaven. Now, um, when she said she saw Samuel, and, and uh, you know, she said, why did you deceive me? And Saul said, what have, what have you seen? I saw God's ascending out of the earth. Now, a couple of places that just come to mind when I, when I read that verse. Number one, Revelation chapter 9. The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. So number one, we have God's coming up out of the earth through this, through this fire and this smoke. Uh, and we know they have, they come up out of the pit because they have a king over them. Uh, in verse 11, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose, he, in, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, and the Greek tongue hath this name Apollyon, which means destroyer. Then I think of uh, Revelation uh, chapter 13. Let me go back to that. I almost had it there. Revelation chapter 13. Uh, we have the beast uh, rising up out of the sea, having seven heads ten, and ten horns. But then in verse 11, John says, I beheld another beast. This one's different than the, than the sea beast. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, like that. And he spake as a dragon. You see, Jesus, when he comes, he comes speaking like his father. Okay? When this beast comes out of the earth, he comes speaking like a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. We know this to be uh, the false prophet. So that's, that's one of the things that, that comes to mind when I see, when I look at the description that this, this woman that hath a familiar spirit. I mean, who did, who did Saul go to? He went to someone who could summon a spirit that would be familiar to Saul. That's who he went to. He didn't go to, uh, he didn't go to one of the prophets. He didn't go to the school of the prophets. He didn't go to anywhere. He went to someone who he knew deliberately would bring up someone who looked like Samuel because she hath a familiar spirit. And God said, don't do that. But God's already turned Saul over and turned his heart over, and Saul is not going to hear from God, and he's not going to hear from the prophet Samuel. So he's going to go for the look-alike Samuel. You see what I'm getting at? Um, let's see here. Second Corinthians. I may have this in my notes already. But Second Corinthians 11. Think about this when you think about this other Samuel, okay? This other Samuel. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, whom, we, whom ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. So I think that this doctrine, this prophecy, this proclamation from the Apostle Paul has a fitting typology or foreshadowing 
in this story of Samuel, Saul, the woman with the familiar spirit, and what saw Saul. He didn't saw Samuel. He saw another Samuel. Okay, I hope you get all that. Now, uh, in verse 14... Saul is going to direct the question to the woman who hath the familiar spirit. And he says, he said unto her, what form is he of? And she said, an old man cometh up and he's covered with a mantle. Now look at the next phrase here. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. So, think about it. Uh, if I were to say Merlin the Magician, does, uh, does the character in your mind of Merlin the Magician look like uh, some young guy wearing basketball shorts and tennis shoes and, uh, you know, a Chicago Bulls t-shirt or I'm just making this up as I go? No. Merlin the Magician, and basically in everybody's mind, is this old man with a mantle over his head. And he's got a, probably got a wizard hat that, you know, points up. And he's got a magic wand or whatever it is, okay? Um, if I were to give you, if I were to say, uh, tell me what Gandalf looks like from Lord of the Rings. Same imagery as not only what uh, the familiar spirit woman saw and reported back to King Saul, but that's what's on this tarot card called the hermit. Now, something that I'm going to point out to you um, that I think has merit concerning what Paul warned us about when he said, uh, if if someone comes preaching another Jesus or another spirit or another gospel, you might, you'll, you'll listen to him. Okay. But me, you won't listen to. And I want you to notice on this tarot card called the hermit, you have this old figure carrying this rod in his hand. He has a mantle over his head, you know, long gray beard. So he's in this old man and he has a lantern in his hand. Now, if you take a close look at the light of that lantern, it's not just this round light beaming out. It's actually a six-pointed star. Some would call it the Star of David, which is on the uh, Israeli flag. What it actually is, is called, it's referred to as the Seal of Solomon. And it's been used in... Kabbalah. It's been used in occult uh, practices, occult symbolism for years and years and years before there ever was a nation of Israel. This symbol was being used. And basically it is the combination of two triangles, one triangle pointing down and it's overlaid by a triangle that's pointing up. And what you have by that is a symbol of the triangle that points up represents the heavens pointing to the heaven. The triangle that's pointing down represents the earth because it's pointing to the earth. And one of them represents the masculine. The other one represents the feminine. And that's as deep as I'm going to go with that. But what basically that symbol represents is what Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. You see, they're opposites. One triangle pointing up, one triangle pointing down. They're not, they're not the same. But they're going to try to mix them together and hopefully that they'll, it'll stick. And what you have in that is uh, the false gospel that somehow... The heavenly realm and all of those evil spirits, no matter what form they're in, 
All of those spirits can be joined with humankind literally into his DNA. But Daniel says, iron doesn't mix with miry clay. Therefore, this won't happen. It won't work. And besides that, we have a stone that's cut without hands, which is Christ. He's going to destroy the feet and the whole thing's going to come down and the wind is going to blow it off like the chaff. All right. So we know that the devil's kingdom won't work in the last days, but still people are trying it. So that's what the, the triangles there. That's what that tarot card represents. And that's what this figure that, uh, the witch of Endor saw. That's who that is. This one is the bringer of a new light. See, that's what he's doing. If you take a look at it, he's offering the world a light. Masonry says we offer light to people who walk in darkness. No, they offer darkness, okay? He's offering a new light, hence a new gospel to this world, but it's not the same gospel as what is in this Bible. All right. And I've got more on this old man uh, coming up here in a little bit. Like right here. Remember this book, Real Ghosts, Restless Spirits, and Haunted Places? Here is another story that Brad Steiger collected and placed into this book about familiar spirits, spirits that haunt houses and palaces and so on. Olaf Johnson, one of the greatest mediums of the 20th century. Let, let me explain what a medium is. A medium is what the woman of Endor was. She is like the go-between between, between our world and the spirit world. And she can, she can reach into the spirit world. That's what she wants everybody to believe and contact the dead or those who have gone on and she can make contact with them and then she can bring the person who comes to her and she can bring them two together now remember what i just said about you know all of these spirits that are in the heavenly realm coming together with mankind does it sound a little bit like that this is why god said you know, when God says, don't do this, he's not just being mean. He's not just trying to take away your candy. God knows how dangerous they are. And when he says, no, don't do this. No, don't go to this person. No, you can't have any of that. When God says that, you should trust him because he knows how dangerous it is. He knows. All right. So anyway, <clears throat> just thought I'd throw that in. That's what a medium is. All right. Olaf Johnson, one of the greatest mediums of the 20th century, once told me that while he accessed the universal mind through meditation. I got to stop here too. Okay. I, there's just so much packed in here. The universal mind. You could say that it's the collective of every evil, unclean, dirty, foul, angry spirit that exists in everywhere, okay? That is the universal mind. And um, it was um, the Apollo, I think it was the Apollo 14 um, astronaut, six man to walk on the moon that basically had an experience with the universal mind. I'm talking about Edgar Mitchell. And um, he had what was called a Samadhi experience. And that all of a sudden he's looking out. They're on their way back from the moon. Uh, he's been working on the moon. He's sitting there in the capsule coming back. He's staring out at it, the stars. And all of a sudden it dawns on him that his body came from uh, humanity of old, which at some point came from just the dirt of the earth, which came from 
just the the star that is our sun that came from the original uh, point of all material that was the Big Bang. And it occurred to him that he literally was one with the entire universe. He was connected with every molecule, every atom, everything that exists. He was, he was connected to them and was one with them. He had that experience. This scientist, okay, had that experience, the universal mind. Anyway, that's what that is. Um, he was aware of spirit beings on other planes of existence. Johnson was the psychic sensitive who participated in astronaut Edgar Mitchell's Apollo 14 ESP experiment between Earth and the moon, February 1971. He said that humans might interpret those intelligences in any way that would be most compatible with our own psyches. One person might experience such an entity as an Indian, he said. Another, da, 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 as an old wise man. Look at that. Yet someone else as a holy figure. That's what this guy would be. And Samuel would represent that. But all these seemingly separate beings are bodiless forms of benign intelligence. These intelligences cloak themselves as Tibetans or cosmic teachers because the human brain will more readily accept an entity that looks like a human being rather than a shapeless, shimmering intelligence. Did you see that? So this uh, Mr. Olaf Johnson who made a connection with Edgar Mitchell, who's now one with everything, okay? Uh, if, <laughs> if, Edgar, if Edgar Mitchell was, go, was to ask a hot dog vendor for a hot dog, and the hot dog vendor asked him, how do you want it? And Edgar Mitchell would say, make me one with everything. <laughs> Moving right along. So here again, there is this connection amongst those of us, I guess, maybe of a, of a European, American, uh, Northern Hemisphere background that would see a, uh, a spirit like this, a familiar spirit like this, who is pretending to be some wise sage that has all the secrets of the universe and is just looking for the right people who have the right vibrations and who have the right kind of, of soul and so on. He's just looking for people like that, that he can share all of this great universal knowledge with them. And that's what people like Stephen Greer and, and countless others are trying to find as, as they round up disciples under themselves, they're trying to hook people into this cosmic con consciousness, they call it, the universal mind. And it's usually characterized as an old man wearing a mantle. Okay? Now, in the book called The Complete Idiot's Guide... To Wicca and Witchcraft... Listen to what it says. You remember how I told you my theories about Mary Magdalene and how she had seven devils and how I thought she might have got it? I was probably wrong. See, I can admit it. When you read this, you'll say, Ah, Hoggard, I think you're on to something. Like guardian angels... Spirit guides are assigned to us at birth. Stop. What did I tell you? That everybody has a spirit given to them at birth that just follows them around, watches them, learns them, knows how they speak, knows how they walk, knows how they talk, knows how they eat, what they like to eat, when they like to eat, knows what kind of music they like to listen to. Everything about this person, a spirit or a group of spirits, are assigned to people. 
and they learn them and become familiar with them. Remember, that's the Bible a definition of it. My, you know, my familiar people. It's people that we are familiar with. Uh, I had a doctor's appointment today. My knee has been bothering me. And so I went to the doctor and he did an x-ray and he comes back and he says, you have arthritis. And I said, what does arthritis even look like? So he pulled up the x-ray and he said, do you know how you recognize your aunt? I said, yeah, because I've seen her, you know, hundreds of times. He said, that's how I can recognize arthritis in somebody's knee or their ankle or whatever. And he said, it's right here. And he pointed right to it. And he told me what he was looking at. And I'm going, oh, okay. So anyway, watch this. Like guardian angels, spirit guides are assigned to us at birth. And we can have as many as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them. Sometimes the spirit guide is a soul who doesn't need to incarnate again. Don't believe that part. Don't buy it. Remember, it is appointed unto man once to die. After this, the judgment. He does not say once, twice, three, thrice, fives, sevenths. He doesn't say that. We don't die six times and are reincarnated all six times and we finally get it right the seventh time. Uh-uh. You get a life to live and one life to live to decide who you're going to live for and whose kingdom you want to be a part of for eternity. And it's that simple. And God makes his kingdom the easiest kingdom to be a part of the richest kingdom to be a part of. And it costs absolutely nothing except that we just believe what God said. Anyway, we can have as many as seven of them. Sometimes the spirit guide is a soul who doesn't need to incarnate again. Your spirit guide, your spirit guides help you to learn your spiritual lesson. They also watch over you and often will quite literally guide you on your path through life. In addition, your spirit guides will sometimes set up learning situations to help you evolve spiritually. And that, again, is from the Complete Idiot's Guide to Wicca and Witchcraft. And remember, Mark 16.9, I'm bringing back up how I was wrong about Mary Magdalene. Uh, when Jesus was risen early in the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. It is very, very possible that Mary Magdalene's seven devils, seven familiar spirits, that she allowed them to take complete control of her. And they dwelt inside of her and basically wrecked her life. You remember the man called Legion. That guy was a mess. That guy was out of his mind being tormented day and night by those devils. And I'm here to tell you that whatever the devil has up his sleeve for you, I promise you, it is going to end up tormenting you. Trust me. Okay, now. First Chronicles chapter 10, notice this. And, and here's, here's the, what I think is the final nail on the coffin. Uh -huh, get it? That what Saul saw, what the woman that had a familiar spirit saw, was not Samuel. It was a familiar spirit. So Saul died. And listen to what? God said is the reason why Saul was, his life was taken. So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord. It's going to define it now. Even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit, 
to inquire of it. So the Bible just told you that Saul, number one, was, was killed because he refused the word of God. Samuel was the word of God. What Samuel told Saul to do concerning, uh, I think it was Amalek uh, or the Amalekites, what, what God told him to do specifically, Saul didn't do it. He just flat out didn't do it. But he lied about it and said that he did. And that was it with God. God said, I'm, I'm not going to forgive you ever again. And Saul's asking for forgiveness and, and he's not getting it. And so God took, the Bible says, God took his Holy Spirit from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord came to Saul. Okay. And then he asked counsel of one that had a familiar spirit. And he inquired of that spirit. That's what it says. For asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. He asked that ghost that looked like Samuel, talked like Samuel, smelled like Samuel, mannerisms like Samuel, everything about him reminded him of Samuel, but it wasn't Samuel. And it doesn't matter uh, what, what this ghost says. It doesn't matter at all. He's listening to a familiar spirit. And so he's, he's got to pay the penalty for it. And the penalty was he ended up taking his own life. Now, um, look in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 8. The priests said not, where is the Lord? And they that handled the law knew me not. The pastors also, listen to this, all, any pastor listening to me, listen to the word of God. The pastors also transgressed against me and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walk not after the things that do not profit. Remember what I just told you here. In fact, I have it in my notes. I'll put it up on the screen for you. Second Corinthians 11. Uh, verse 3, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, so another Samuel is like a foreshadowing of another Jesus to us. There is coming to this world another Jesus. And my hope is that you will be drawn into the Word of God enough and you'll study it and you'll meditate on it and you'll think on these things and the Holy Ghost will draw Scripture up to your mind when the fake Jesus is displayed to the world, you're going to say, that's not Jesus. That is not Jesus. I may lose my life here. But that's not Jesus. Okay, now, it may not happen that way, but if it does, do you want to know for sure who the right Jesus is? That's what I want you to know. That's what I want to know. Number one, preacheth another Jesus whom we've not preached, or if you received another spirit. So if we go back to Jeremiah, the prophets and the preachers. The pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal. Baal's the spirit, and walked after things that do not profit. Like following after Baal. So the prophets, according to this verse, the prophets received their visions and their teachings by way of a god a familiar spirit called Baal. I just wonder, I, and I don't know this. Baal has the name Al in it. 
It is the, um, the uh, Arabian or Arabic word for God, Allah. But their Allah is not our Elohim. It's not the same. I may be off my rocker, just... But to me, it's, it's interesting that you have <clears throat> over a billion and a half, maybe getting up to two billion because Muslims have large families. Their goal is to overpopulate the earth with Muslims. It's working, isn't it? Okay. Uh, just go to, um, uh, go up to Detroit um, or Dearbornistan any of those places, okay? Uh, and you'll see it. But anyway, um, the, the prophets and the, the preachers, the pastors, they're all preaching and prophesying. A spirit is giving them their messages while they're speaking it, while they're preaching it, or maybe while they're studying for it. They're giving them their messages. It's all coming from a familiar spirit called Baal. Okay, now uh, let's finish reading that. A preacheth another Jesus whom you have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, you, will, you might well bear with him. And I'm telling you, if it's another Jesus and it's another spirit, it will be another gospel. And it's going to be given by way of seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and i can assure you this the gospel that they're going to preach and the one that everybody's going to accept is a gospel that feels so absolutely amazing to the flesh of mankind. Mankind will say, oh, that's, that's, that's the one I want right there. It's, it's like, why do people who take heroin once want to take it again? It is so overpowering. The rush, the buzz that you get from that it is so overpowering that once they come down, they want to go right back up. It's a shame. But I have a feeling that's, that's what is going to come to this world. Okay, the, the people of this world are going to be deceived by a false Christ that is going to lead them astray by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. In Matthew 24, verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. F Watch this. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And in verse 24, the same chapter, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets. Remember, they're prophesying by Baal. And shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now, I like this because it says that it's not possible to deceive the very elect. That's what it's saying. It's not, and very doesn't mean, well, I'm, I'm more of an elect person than you are. Okay. I'm very elect. You're only like somewhat elect. That's not what it means. Very means truly. See, there's fake Christians and the very elect. They've been verified because they believed verily, verily, I say unto thee. Okay? That's what it means. So now, let's think about, let's think about this idea for a minute of another Jesus coming on the scene and bringing a different gospel. 
another spirit of some kind coming down from heaven to bring mankind a gospel that will that will feel better to him than whiskey, heroin, meth, cocaine, fentanyl, you name it. Okay? Only it's more deadly than all of those put together. Because cocaine can kill your body. Accepting this false gospel can kill your soul. What did Paul say in Galatians chapter 1? Verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Now listen to what he said. This is, he's not just, just saying stuff. I think he's telling us what to look for. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. So, the Apostle Paul just said, number one, there's going to be someone <clears throat> coming to give you another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel. Jesus told us that um, there's going to be people pretending to be Christ, and people are going to believe that they're Christ, and they're going to deceive many. The Old Testament prophets always warned that the false prophets are there everywhere and they prophesy by Baal, the evil spirit that the Israelites always turned to, always did. That's why God always was upset with them because they always turned to Baal. After living for God for a while, they just turned to Baal. And so the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, doesn't matter where you go, the Bible's warning you. There is a different spirit that's going to mislead millions of people. A different gospel that is going to deceive billions of people and going to uh, basically condemn their souls to an eternal lake of fire. There is going to be another gospel that's going to be preached. But it's a gospel that will be so hard to turn away from that if it were possible, the truly elect would be falling for it. That's a little scary. But it's giving us the assurance that if we're truly born again, we won't be taken in by it. Okay? Then, um, we have this. This is the story of how a man by the name of Joe... Smith, or, or excuse me, Joseph Smith. This is the story of how somebody came down from heaven and gave him another testament, which is another gospel. Let's look at it. Smith said he saw a pillar of light brighter than the noonday sun that slowly descended on him growing in brightness as it descended and lighting the entire area for some distance. As the light reached the treetops, Smith feared the trees might catch fire. But when it reached the ground and enveloped him, it produced a peculiar sensation. What did I, I tell you? Felt good to him. It was a sensation. Ooh. His mind was caught away from the natural objects with which he was surrounded. And he was enwrapped in a heavenly vision. Now remember, what Joe Smith saw was a pillar 
of light. Where did he get that idea from? Did he get it from the Old Testament? The pillar of fire that led Israel by the night? Or was it something just brand new that, that he really experienced? You know, as I'm reading this, I've read enough UFO stories and things like that to know that that, that sounds like a very real UFO encounter that Joe Smith very, might very well have happened to him. I'm not saying it did. Can't say I, it didn't. But it just sounds like something familiar to me. Let's keep reading. While experiencing the vision, he said he saw one or more personages described differently in Smith's accounts. In his earliest written account, Smith said he saw the Lord. In diary entries, he said he saw a visitation of angels or a vision of angels that included a personage and then another personage who testified that Jesus Christ is the Son of God as well as many angels. What did I tell you? The we or an angel from heaven bring you any other gospel, let him be cursed. Mm. Now, in later accounts, Smith consistently said that he had seen two personages who appeared one after the other. These personages exactly resembled each other in their features or likeness. The first personage had light complexion, blue eyes, a piece of white cloth drawn over his shoulders, his right arm bare. In later accounts, one of the personages called Smith by name and said, pointing to the other, this is my beloved son, hear him. Although Smith did not explicitly identify the personages, most Latter-day Saints infer that they were God the Father and Jesus. Mm-mm-mm. Well, let's check, shall we? Let's check the scriptures. One place that I can turn to and I can tell you whether or not this really happened or not. What what he's saying is is that one personage was Jesus. What he's also saying is the other personage must be God who is saying this is my beloved son. So according to Joe Smith himself he saw God's face. Now, I don't really know what kind of life Joe Smith lived. I've heard a few things, okay? But I know a guy named Moses who spent 40 days up on Mount Sinai and he wanted to see God. And he says in verse uh, chapter 33, Exodus 33, verse 18, He said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. That's it. It's done. I don't need to read anything else. I don't need to search the matter out any further. Bottom line is, if Joseph Smith said that he saw God the Father's face, he either lied or he died. One of the two. My money is going on he lied about it. And yet it amazes me 
how so many hundreds of millions, maybe, I don't know how many Mormons there are in the world, but it's the, it is, you, you might say that it is the quintessential American religion. Okay? That religion got its start right here in good old USA back in the 1800s. And at a time when you could travel great distance and and uh, set your tents up, build your houses, and marry young teenage girls without anybody saying a word to you, you know, after you get kicked out of Nauvoo, Illinois. Um, but anyway, that's their religion. And w w you can go to uh, uh, Utah, Idaho, uh, let's see, Montana, portions of Washington, portions of, of Oregon, that whole area up there just swamped New Mexico, Colorado, just swamped with Mormons. They're everywhere up there. See, people can, can believe a fairy tale doctrine so absolutely ridiculous, and yet they believe it because there are things about it that appeal to their flesh. Okay? Now, that's basically the gist of what all of these supernatural appearances, there are some that like to scare people and bring fear to them, and some people will just bow down out of fear. But then there are countless others who, once they've had encounters with various spirits, familiar spirits, they receive a feeling that is so overwhelmingly good and positive. And I've heard people at, at MUFON conferences talk about how when the aliens touched them or when the saucer came right overhead, they experienced a love, a pure love, unlike anything they had ever felt in their life. And it just, I look at that and I think people are going to be taken in either by fear or by feeling. But they're going to fall for this false gospel that's coming. Now, the next video, get ready, because I'm going to show you how these familiar spirits manifest themselves and work inside of already established religions in order to defile them. Remember what God said? Don't have anything to do with people that have familiar spirits to be defiled by them. Have familiar spirits defiled Christianity? Oh. Wait till you see what I'm going to show you. Now, the next part might make you angry because I'm going to reveal some things about some people that maybe you've watched on TBN or people that you've sent money to or things that you had believed at one point. I'm only trying to show you the truth. You decide what you're going to do with it. God bless you. It's always a joy to bring these videos to you. I hope they are a blessing to you. You are a blessing to us and we certainly appreciate your prayers, your support for us, and uh, just the, the kind messages that you send. May God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.